You know, it's very difficult to talk to people about vaccinations. They seem to have their mind completely made up. But that is a luxury that we have when we have not had experience with pandemics. Now we're dealing with COVID-19. This is a pandemic, and it's a good time to have a look at this issue again. Now, many of our parents and grandparents remember the last waves of polio in the early 1950s. There are very few people alive today that experienced firsthand our last great pandemic, and that is the Spanish influenza of 1918 and 1919. So I thought that it would be important for us to revisit it. So let's cue up the music and learn about the Spanish flu. COVID-19 is a very serious illness. The Spanish flu epidemic of 1918-1919 infected over 500 million people worldwide. That's a third of the world's population. 50 to 100 million people died of complications of the Spanish influenza, including 650,000 Americans. We lost more troops in World War I due to the influenza alone than we lost in all of the Korean War. Many of us have had the flu in our lives. We get sick, we're miserable, we eat some chicken soup, we get better. The mortality rate for a healthy adult is less than 0.1%. It's difficult to imagine a pandemic like the Spanish flu, where 500 million people, one-third of the population of the world, became ill. 50 to 100 million people died of the Spanish flu in the 18 months that the United States was involved in the First World War. We had 53,000 combat casualties. We had 63,000 casualties due to disease. 43,000 of those deaths were due to Spanish influenza. Put this into some perspective and compare it to our seasonal flu now. One village in Alaska of 80 people lost 72 of them to the flu. Now, a couple of notes about the character of the Spanish flu. 99% of the victims of Spanish flu were under the age of 65. Over 50% were between 20 and 40 years old young people in the prime of their life. As a result, the average lifespan of men and women in the United States dropped by 12 years in 1918. This was at a time before women went into combat, and you may be able to try and explain away the drop in the average lifespan of the young men due to combat deaths. But notice that women also dropped the same 12 years. In 1918, medicine was very different than it is today. While many doctors did understand that bacteria led to disease, viruses were very poorly understood. Antibiotics were, for the most part, not available. We didn't have intensive care as we would see now with ventilators. Most of the care in 1918 was supportive and nutritional. In February 1918, a country doctor from rural Haskell County, Kansas, wrote the United States Public Health Service. He wanted to advise them of a new strain of severe flu that he ran into in six or eight of his patients. They were much sicker than other cases of flu that he was aware of. His letter was ignored. On December 30th, 2019, a Chinese ophthalmologist named Dr. Li wrote a post on a message board warning his colleagues of a new SARS-like flu that he was seeing in some of his patients at his hospital in Wuhan, China. While Dr. Minor was ignored, Dr. Li was called in by the authorities and advised in very strong terms to stop spreading rumors in the community. On January 10th, he treated a woman with glaucoma. Within days, Dr. Li became ill by the first part of February, Li was deathly ill. China had declared a state of emergency due to the new Wuhan or coronavirus, and the authorities apologized to Dr. Li. However, it didn't do him very much good as he died of the disease on February 6th. Our trips outside the house are only for necessities and quite infrequent but we do read the local newspapers online and see the TV news. We hear spring breakers talking about how they'll continue to party until they can't party anymore and they're not worried about catching the flu. Recently, there was a letter to the editor about somebody complaining about the cancellation of the Final Four because of this coronavirus. He felt that it was an inconvenience to him and he didn't really worry about catching the flu. He'd do fine. Because of this lack of concern 
I think it's a good time to revisit the pandemic of 1918-1919. We'll see the mistakes that were made then and see how we're trying to correct those mistakes now. The Spanish flu of 1918 to 1919 was influenza A of the type H1N1. We recently had an outbreak of such a flu in 2009-2010, and one of my friends died from it. Now, influenza A is an avian flu. It starts in birds. Now, the thing that makes it deadly is that it jumps species. It goes from birds, generally to an intermediate species, such as a pig, and then it's transformed in the pig to something that they can transmit to humans. Then we get human-to-human -human transmission. The reason that we look in China is that their main staple of food is rice. Rice is grown in open patties. The farmers bring in ducks to control pests and snails. Once the rice is harvested and the patties are drained, local pigs are allowed to come in and wallow in the mud. Here is the transmission from the birds to the pigs to the farmers. And once it's in the farmers, they transmit it from human to human. With modern epidemiology, we know that flus that start in China generally will hit the United States in approximately 12 months. When we see what's in China, they make an educated guess as to which strains will make it all the way to the United States the next year. They take those strains and use them to manufacture vaccines. Some years they guess well, some years not so well. But the end result is that generally every year we have a relatively effective flu vaccine available for the strains of the flu that hit us during flu season. Now, the specific source of the Spanish influenza is not known for certain. There were soldiers that came to the battlefront in World War I from Southeast Asia. They had respiratory issues in 1916 and 1917. That may have been the earliest forms of the Spanish influenza. There was also a British Army field hospital in northern France that reported a very significant number of cases of flu and a number of deaths just prior to the outbreak of the first wave of the Spanish influenza. But the most likely scenario is that it started in Haskell County, Kansas, and the 18 patients and three deaths described by Dr. Minor were the first cases of the Spanish influenza. The United States entered World War I in April of 1917, and it started a draft in June of 1917. Young men from all over the country went to approximately 32 different training camps scattered throughout the country, and each of these camps had between 35 and 55,000 young men. One such camp was Camp Funston, which is near modern-day Fort Riley in Kansas. Young men from Haskell County, Kansas, were drafted into the Army and reported at the end of February, early March of 1918. On March 4th, a camp cook named Arthur Mitchell reported to sick call with severe symptoms of the flu. Mitchell, as I said, was a cook and had been in contact with hundreds, if not thousands, of men. And within three weeks, over 1,100 men at Camp Funston were ill with the flu. The camp was severely overcrowded, and many of the men were living in tents in the open. The camp commander went against regulations and brought those men out of the field into barracks. This severely crowded them, with over 250 men in each building. These crowded, enclosed conditions were ripe for infectious disease of any kind. The Spanish influenza, and measles for that matter, were introduced to this population, and thousands became sick. The regulations regarding housing were in place because traditionally, armies were more susceptible to disease than other armies. Bringing large groups of young men into close proximity, especially when those men came from rural communities and did not have much of a travel history, meant that they did not have the immunity against the diseases that, say, city dwellers would have. As a result, epidemics were a chronic problem in military camps. The Spanish influenza was a particularly bad one. The young men that reported to sick call complained of body aches and shortness of breath and weakness to the point that they would fall to the floor. The illness had an extraordinarily rapid onset. Some men would be well at breakfast, and dead by dinner. The disease had a very rapid progression, leading to pneumonia and cyanosis. The men would turn blue. Pulmonary edema would set in, and they would literally drown in their own bodily fluids. The disease quickly overwhelmed the medical facilities at Camp Funston. 
Now, in our next episode, we're going to talk about the first of three waves of Spanish influenza that swept the world. We'll discuss the epidemiology, the decisions that were made, the strategies that worked to contain it, and the strategies that did not. In the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by.